Two incidents, one location, the Killsby sinkhole. 18-year-olds Patrick and Brett decided to go to the Killsby sinkhole for a leisurely dive with their friends. They descended into the cave, and when the next diver tried to follow them, the safety line disappeared. 41 years later, a 52-year-old health practitioner was diving with his friend when he developed breathing problems 104 feet below. Located on a picturesque sheep farm amidst the stunning rolling countryside of South Australia, just 8 miles south of Mount Gambier lies the Killsby Sinkhole, a naturally occurring karst sinkhole that has been used for recreational diving as well as civilian and police diver training since the late 1960s. This unique geological feature offers a wealth of experiences for divers of all levels, making it an ideal location for adventure seekers. Hillsby Cave, which is classified as a sinkhole dive, is theoretically the easiest level for divers and is mostly used for beginner dives. It's easily accessible thanks to its open cabin area. Reports indicate that about 1,000 dives are conducted at the sinkhole every year, making it a popular diving location for the past 40 years. The sinkhole offers clear water and allows divers to descend up to 131 feet below the surface, which adds to its allure. However, the sinkhole also has many twists and turns, which makes it notoriously dangerous. One of the biggest risks is that someone or something could end up anywhere within the system, making the recovery process quite lengthy. Despite these risks, divers continue to be drawn to the Killsby sinkhole thanks to its unique geological features and exciting diving experiences. The 18-year-olds, Brett and Patrick, were relatively new to diving when they decided to venture down to Mount Gambier with a group of friends, including George and Carrie, to engage in some pleasurable diving. While George had previously gone diving with Brett and Pat in the sinkhole the day before, he had to surface early due to ear problems. Despite George's setback, the group was still eager to continue their diving adventure. They had made a successful dive to 180 feet. After the exhilarating experience, they attended a late-night dance, making for a long and exciting day. On April 6, 1969, a group of 10 individuals consisting of three scuba divers, four snorkelers, and three non-diving friends arrived at the sinkhole at precisely 11 a.m. Four of the group members had intended to engage in a snorkeling activity around the cave, while the remaining three individuals, Brett and Pat, were set to undertake a deep dive and George was to take photographs near the surface of the sinkhole. George, one of the group members, had issued a warning to the others about not diving too deep due to their lack of experience and the lack of essential equipment, such as watches and twin scuba cylinders, which were critical for their safety. However, despite George's warning, the group felt confident enough to engage in the deep dive as they had completed a similar dive the previous day. Furthermore, the group expressed the not-so-wise intention of wanting to scratch their names on the cave's wall, which was located at a depth of approximately 196 feet. This objective was especially reckless given their lack of experience, their overweight condition, and the absence of essential equipment required for the dive. After taking some photos on the surface of the main lake, they began their descent. As they descended, they took one end of a 164-foot safety rope with them, while their companion held the other end at the surface. Carrie observed as Brett and Pat reached the bottom at a depth of approximately 91 feet. They stopped for a minute on the dark silt slope to secure their end of the safety line to a large boulder. They then proceeded to move horizontally into the extensive cave located to the southwest of the entrance lake. Shortly after, the safety line became tight and the surface end was released so they could pull it in behind them. George had the intention of following the safety line down, but he faced an issue as he tried to tie his camera to the rope ladder. The safety line had vanished by then. After descending to a depth of roughly 98 feet, he discovered their line fastened to a boulder, but didn't spot any sign of his companions when he peered into the dark and murky cavern beyond. 
Although he decided to wait for a few minutes, his apprehension increased when his companions failed to return, even after five minutes had elapsed. Therefore, he ascended to the surface and conversed with Carrie about his concerns, which led to his decision to dive again for as long as he could. When George went down once more, he activated his backup air supply as he reached a depth of 98 feet. He arrived at the tie-off boulder and examined the line once more, but he couldn't spot any movement in the dark, clear water. He realized that time was running out and he was low on air, so he resolved to return to the surface. However, he saw something gleaming in the corner of his eye, approximately 32 feet to the left of the main line in the chamber as he turned to go up. As George swam across the dark and chilly waters, his eyes caught a faint light flickering in the distance. He recognized it as a torch and swam closer, hoping to find his diving companions safe and sound. However, as he approached, a harrowing sight met his eyes. He saw one of his fellow divers lying lifelessly on his back, with no sign of movement or breath. And a few meters away lay the second diver, also in a motionless state. George's heart sank as he realized that they were both dead. Overwhelmed with shock and disbelief, George's mind raced, and he knew that he had to act fast. His first instinct was to swim up to the surface, and he turned around and swam back as fast as he could. With his heart pounding and his lungs screaming for air, he broke through the surface just as his breath was about to give out. Gasping for air, he quickly informed the others of the tragic turn of events. Although they were all devastated and saddened by the loss of their fellow divers, they knew they had to do something to help. They were far from any assistance, and the only option was to exit the hole and go for help. It took a skilled diver with approximately six years of experience, along with the help of others, three hours to recover the lifeless bodies of Pat and Brett. Despite the long wait, the victims' torches were still glowing. Pat's gear had sustained severe damage, with the loss of his mask, torch, snorkel, knife, and one fin. However, his cylinder still contained about 700 psi of air, and his buoyancy vest had not been inflated, even though he was still wearing his weight belt. In contrast, all of Brett's gear was intact, but his scuba cylinder was empty. He was using a twin hose regulator, and during the recovery operation, it was seen to vent itself for approximately two minutes. The post-mortem examination was carried out by a local doctor, and during the coroner's inquest in May 1969, he stated, In my opinion, death was the result of air embolism due to decompression. The doctor also said that he believed that Pat and Brett had died of drowning and vasovagal inhibition. What seemed to have happened is that the divers lost track of their bottom time and air supplies while under the influence of nitrogen narcosis, leading to their running out of air. The tragedy underscores the importance of proper training and adherence to safe diving practices. Nitrogen narcosis is a serious issue that can infect even the most experienced divers, and it's critical to remain vigilant and mindful of one's surroundings at all times. It's a sobering reminder of the dangers inherent in diving and the need to take every possible precaution to ensure a safe and enjoyable diving experience. Dr. Robert McAllister, 52, along with his friend, went on a dive in the Killsby sinkhole on March 13, 2010. He was a proficient diver and a health professional residing in the eastern suburb of Langwaren. Robert's wife, Robin McAllister, provided him with support on his many diving adventures. He had a fondness for cave diving, especially in Mount Gambier, where he followed strict safety protocols and maintained his equipment with almost military precision. These trips were a yearly highlight for him, allowing him to immerse himself in his passion for the subterranean world. Although Robert's co-diver and friend was not as experienced, he was a regular dive companion. The previous day, Robert had completed a successful dive in a different location near Mount Gambier. However, on this specific occasion, he was utilizing new equipment that he was not accustomed to. Robert and his friend were having a good time diving at the sinkhole, descending to a depth of approximately 104 feet. 
During the dive, Robert's friend noticed that he was in distress and made an attempt to help him out of the situation. However, a brief struggle ensued between the two, as Robert pulled off his mask and mouthpiece in an attempt to access his friend's equipment. As the altercation continued, Robert became increasingly aggressive and began to grasp at his friend's mask and equipment, which made it impossible for them to engage in the buddy breathing technique that is typically used in such situations. This created an even more tense atmosphere as Robert's friend realized that he needed to take action before the situation resulted in both of them becoming fatalities. As he watched his friend struggle to breathe at such depths, Robert's friend became traumatized and overwhelmed with a feeling of helplessness, knowing that there was very little he could do to assist his friend in this dire situation. The entire experience left him shaken and affected him deeply. As soon as he emerged from the water's surface, he promptly alerted the emergency services of his situation and subsequently received care for shock from paramedics present at the scene. Following this, he proceeded to inform the police of the incident, and this was around 12.15 p.m. The distressing and traumatic experience he had just undergone was undeniably harrowing and distressing for him. The following day, members of the South Australia Police Underwater Recovery Unit from Adelaide prepared for the body recovery and dived into the depths of the water to a maximum depth of approximately 164 feet. After an extensive search, the recovery team eventually discovered the deceased body of Robert, who was found to be entangled in the cave's guide ropes. There are conflicting reports regarding whether his death was a result of being entangled in the guide ropes and if his friend attempted to assist him in freeing himself. Some divers are puzzled by his failure to cut the ropes to extricate himself, assuming that's what happened. The fact that the other diver left suggests that he may have been low on air, as he would have otherwise stayed nearby in case his buddy needed assistance. While medical problems are a possibility, it's unlikely that they occurred at the same time as the entanglement, if that was indeed the issue. All of this is speculation, but some accidents are more perplexing than others, and we can only guess what happened. The news of Dr. McAllister's passing came as a shock to many due to his reputation as a selfless caregiver who dedicated himself to helping the sick. One of which was that he provided medical care to one family for 26 years, spanning four generations and playing a vital role in the establishment of the Frankston Sexual Health Clinic located south of Melbourne. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.